Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We have gotten so many requests over the years for an episode on Eugene Jacques Bullard. And for a while, I was answering a lot of them because there were a lot. And my answer was like, yes, he's on the list. There's one book I really want to read as part of the research. I can't get my hands on it right now. Uh, Because, overwhelmingly, the request that we got described Bullard as the first Black American fighter pilot, which is true. But he also had this really full and fascinating life beyond that that isn't really touched on in, like, the viral Facebook posts and stuff that people were sending us as part of their episode requests. There's one book that's focused mostly on that, though. It's called Eugene Bullard, Black Expatriate in Jazz Age Paris, but I could only find it in one library I had access to. That library stopped lending books at the beginning of the pandemic, and once they started lending books again, getting to the library was a different pandemic issue. (laughs) And uh, then all of that was resolved, and it took me another year plus to actually get back to looking at this, uh, because I had plenty of other stuff to do. Um, Also, if folks are about to send me a note about interlibrary loan, I know about interlibrary loan. That was not an option for similar reasons during this stretch of time. So anyway, all of this is resolved. My resource issues resolved. Library access resolved. uh, And there are also new resources about him that have come out more recently. So we are finally getting to this much-requested episode that people have been asking us to do for years. And actually, we're doing two episodes because it turns out when you get more into all the stuff that's beyond <laughs> being a combat pilot in World War I, it, uh, it turns into a lot. So <laughs> you will get it all. Eugene James Bullard was the seventh of ten children born to William and Josephine Bullard, and most people called him Gene. Although some sources say his date of birth is unclear, it was recorded in the family Bible as October 9th, 1895. The Bullards lived in Columbus, Georgia, which is in the western part of the state, right on the Chattahoochee River on the border with Alabama. William had been enslaved from birth, and he had both African and Muscogee Creek ancestry. Most accounts also describe Josephine as Creek, but it's not totally clear how many connections the family had to other indigenous people while Jean was growing up. The city of Columbus is located in the Muscogee Nation's ancestral lands. It's in a county that was named for the Muscogee. But the federal government had removed many of the Muscogee from Georgia and other parts of the Southeast over the 1820s and 30s. This removal is really a whole other story, but it was connected to a fraudulent treaty that had been negotiated without most of the Muscogee Nation's involvement and in violation of Muscogee law. And it was part of a bigger federal effort to remove indigenous peoples from the eastern U.S. to land west of the Mississippi River. But intermarriages between people with African and Muscogee ancestry weren't uncommon during this period. The Muscogee both enslaved people of African descent and accepted free Black people as tribal citizens. And it's possible that William Bullard had been living among some of the Muscogee people who were still in Georgia when he married Josephine in 1882. Yeah, we really just don't have a lot of information about how he conceived of this as part of his identity, and most sources describe him as African-American or Black. As a large family of both Indigenous and African ancestry, though, the Bullards often really struggled financially. William mostly worked as a stevedore or doing other labor, while Josephine took in laundry. They also took in boarders to their home to try to make extra money. While they were doing all this to try to make ends meet, Josephine also tried to protect Jean and his siblings from the extreme and sometimes violent racism of the world they were living in. For example, two Black men were lynched and their bodies were desecrated in the middle of town when Jean was just a year old. Jean started attending a school that had been founded by the Freedmen's Bureau in 1901, at which point it became a lot harder for his family to shield him from racism. His mother also died on August 24th, 1902, at the age of 37. Jean was almost seven 
Her cause of death is not noted anywhere, but taking in laundry was hot, exhausting work, and this followed a stretch of particularly hot weather in Georgia. Gene's last year at the Freedmen's Bureau School was in 1906 when he was 10. And around that same time, his father had a fight with the white foreman at a warehouse where he worked. This foreman had been harassing and abusing Black employees, and William seems to have foreseen that this was going to end in violence, and that when it did, his life would be at risk. Gene later related a conversation William had with him and his siblings who were still living at home, telling them that if something ever happens to him, he wanted them all to be good. Eventually, this foreman hit William with a hook that was used to unload bales of cotton. And William fought back, throwing him through a hole in the floor that dropped into a cellar under the warehouse. The foreman was badly injured, but survived. William apparently had a good rapport with the owner of the warehouse, W.C. Bradley, and he had already told Bradley about the foreman's abuse. Bradley seems to have tried to keep this whole incident quiet, but word still got out about it. A mob of drunk, angry white men came to the Bullard house to kill William. William was inside the house with his shotgun aimed at the locked front door, and the children were all hiding. When they couldn't get into the house, and it also seemed like nobody was home, the mob seems to have eventually given up. Gene was still a child, but at this point, he decided it was time to leave. The first few times he tried, though, his father found him, brought him home, and punished him for running away. Then, when Gene was 11, he sold a goat and cart that belonged to him to another boy for a dollar and 50 cents, and he left again, this time managing to evade his father. For about the next five years, Gene traveled all over Georgia, living and working for an assortment of people, including Black sharecroppers, white landowners, and a group of Romani people from England. This particular group had a big influence on him. Gene stayed with them for several months. He helped care for their horses and learned to race them. And they told him that the racism he had been living through in Georgia didn't exist in England. When it became clear that they did not plan to go back to England anytime soon, Gene left, hoping that he would be able to make it there on his own. This took a while. He worked for a series of people in rural parts of Georgia before hopping a train to Atlanta. When he got to Newport News, Virginia, he stowed away on a ship that he thought was headed across the Atlantic, but it docked at the port in Norfolk, Virginia, just a few hours later. In Norfolk, he found a ship called the Marta Russ, which was headed for Scotland. The crew spoke mostly German, but some spoke a little English, and they seemed happy to let Gene run errands for them while they prepared to leave in exchange for a little money. Gene used this money to buy himself some food, and then he hid aboard the Marta Russ before it departed on March 4th, 1912. About three days into the voyage, though, he ran out of that food, and he came out of hiding. He was put to work in the boiler room, hauling cinders and ashes to be dumped overboard, and then he started learning some German from the crew. He was put ashore when they got to Aberdeen, Scotland, and the captain gave him five English pounds. He stayed in Aberdeen for a few months before making his way to Glasgow. Bullard described himself as feeling like he had been born into a new world. The people around him were mostly white, and it would be wrong to suggest that no one was prejudiced or that there was no racism. It would also be inaccurate to say that there was never any racist violence. As one example, in Glasgow in 1919, a white mob chased down a group of predominantly black sailors and lay siege to their boarding house. But overall, people seemed to view Gene with curiosity, not with the malicious hostility he had been enduring from white people in the United States. Something happened during this period that really emphasized this difference. It's not clear exactly how or how much Bullard was in touch with his family after leaving the U.S., but not long after arriving in Europe, he got word that his oldest brother, Hector, had been lynched. Hector had inherited a peach farm that had been passed down through their mother's side of the family, and white squatters had tried to take it over. Hector had refused to give in to them, and they had murdered him. We'll get back to Eugene's story uh, and what happened while he was in the UK after a sponsor break. 
In late 1912, Eugene Bullard moved to Liverpool. He'd been making ends meet through a range of odd jobs, including acting as a lookout for street performers to warn them if the police were coming. In Liverpool, he worked at a carnival attraction where somebody would put their face through a hole in a sheet and then they would try to dodge as customers threw these soft rubber balls at them. In Bullard's own account, he told the proprietor of this attraction that he would make a lot more money if Bullard was the target instead of a white person. This turned out to be true. I find this whole idea deeply troubling. Uh, But uh, based on his own descriptions, this is another example of how he just felt a lot safer as a Black man in Europe than he had felt in the United States. In Liverpool, Bullard also started performing with a vaudeville company, something else that he saw differently in Europe than in the U.S. Black vaudeville performers were expected to follow a lot of the same racist tropes in England as they were in the U.S., and white performers on both sides of the Atlantic performed in blackface. But Bullard saw this as flouting stereotypes and expectations, not as being subjected to them or reinforcing them. Bullard also made friends with a man named Chris Baldwin, who owned a boxing gym and started teaching Bullard how to box. And soon Bullard was making connections with other Black boxers from the United States who were in the UK. This included Jack Johnson and Aaron Lister Brown, who was known as the Dixie Kid. Brown invited Bullard to come with him to London so they could train together, In London, Bullard started living in a predominantly Black neighborhood, and a lot of the other residents there were also Black expatriates from the United States. Brown and Bullard traveled to cities around Europe to box, but it took a while for Bullard to get where he really wanted to go, and that was Paris. A lot of accounts of his life describe him as having family from Martinique and hearing through family lore that France was racially tolerant. Although that doesn't line up with the historical record, and it might be a backstory that he developed once he was in France to try to explain his affinity for the country. Yeah, he he clearly got the idea from someone at some point that Paris was a place he would like to be. Uh, But exactly who that was or how is a little fuzzier. Buller did finally get to Paris for a boxing match in late 1913, though, and as expected, he immediately fell in love with it As soon as he was back in London after the match, he talked to Brown about wanting to go back to Paris as soon as possible, but the Dixie Kid already had a string of matches lined up in London, so Bullard decided to make his way back to Paris on his own. He joined a minstrel troupe that was starting on a tour, and then he quit as soon as they got to Paris. (laughs) They were basically his ride with him doing some work along the way. After settling in Paris, Bullard started using the middle name Jacques as a nod to his love for his new home. I understand completely, Jean. Uh, However, on June 28, 1914, not long after Bullard finally got to France, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife Sophie, Duchess of Hohenberg, were assassinated, sparking the First World War. Even though he was not French and the United States was not yet involved in the war, Bullard wanted to serve the nation that he had fallen in love with, and he joined the French Foreign Legion on October 9th, 1914, which would have been his 19th birthday. Bullard was initially stationed along the Somme River as a machine gunner, and he also did extremely dangerous work, like trying to retrieve bodies from no man's land and cutting through barbed wire in preparation for assaulting the enemy's trenches. Over the course of 1915, the Foreign Legion saw so many casualties in this area that units had to be merged together as they lost too many soldiers. Meanwhile, it doesn't seem like Bullard had any contact with his father since arriving in Europe, but somehow William Bullard had figured out where he was and what he was doing, and William was trying to find him. William Bullard wrote a letter to the U.S. State Department, apparently believing that at 19, Gene was too young to legally enlist, although that was not the case. Somehow, William's attempts to find Gene got all the way to the U.S. Secretary of State and then the American ambassador in Paris, William Sharp, although Sharp does not seem to have taken any action on it. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of heartrending, the the effort that he was going through to find his son, but also seemingly totally misguided about whether 
Gene had the legal right to be doing what he was doing, which he did. By late 1915, tens of thousands of men in the French Foreign Legion had been killed in action, and that included a lot of people among Bullard's unit at the Battle of Champagne. At that point, their numbers were just too far reduced to keep consolidating these Foreign Legion units, so survivors were transferred into the regular French army. Bullard was sent to the 170th Infantry Regiment of the Moroccan Division, nicknamed the Swallows of Death. When he got there, Bullard continued to be a machine gunner. The Battle of Verdun stretched through almost all of 1916 as Germany tried to capture the French fort city of Verdun. Verdun had both strategic and symbolic importance, and Germany hoped that France's efforts to defend it would turn into a war of attrition. Verdun was nicknamed the Meat Grinder because of its relentless deadliness, and that had been Germany's strategy from the beginning. Bullard was seriously wounded at Verdun on March 2nd, 1916, just a couple of weeks into a nearly year-long battle. An artillery shell had exploded nearby him, knocking out most of his teeth and also killing several of the men who were with him. He continued fighting, though, and then three days later was seriously wounded for the second time, this time in the leg while trying to deliver a message from one officer to another. That wound could have killed him. It barely missed his femoral artery, and he had to be evacuated and taken to Lyon by Red Cross train. He was hospitalized for months, and while in the hospital, he was awarded the Croix de Guerre for his heroism. This was one of 14 honors that he would earn during the war. Yeah, it wasn't the first one he received, but it was one of the most notable. Bullard spent about six months in recovery and physical therapy from his leg injury. And while he did recover more function in his leg than doctors had expected, he still needed a cane to walk afterward. There was no way he could go back to being a machine gunner for the infantry. Apart from it being an infantry role, the machine gunners were, like, hauling these very heavy machine guns from place to place. He thought his skills as a machine gunner in the infantry might make him a good aircraft gunner, though, so he asked for a transfer. And we'll get to that after a quick sponsor break. Eugene Bullard had some leave, and he went back to Paris until October of 1916. And after that, he went to Cazalac, France, to train as an aircraft gunner. It's possible that he always thought this might be a way to move into training as a pilot, but at some point he heard about the Lafayette Escadrille. This was named for the Marquis de Lafayette and organized by Americans to give American pilots a chance to fly for France, It was also an effort to put some pressure on the United States to become involved in the war. Kind of like, hey, these Americans are already flying for France and they are making you look bad by not also stepping up. After learning about the Lafayette Escadrille, Bullard asked if he could move into pilot training instead of gunnery training, and he was transferred to aviation school in Tours in the fall of 1916. Bullard earned his pilot certificate on May 5th, 1917, and then he went back to Paris for almost a week of leave. At some point previously, he had made a bet with American expatriate Jeff Dixon, who was in Europe hoping to become a boxing promoter. Dixon had bet Bullard $2,000 that he would never become a pilot. Bullard collected his winnings and spent his leave treating everyone he knew to dinners and drinks and generally having a good time. But then Bullard didn't receive orders for where to report once his leave was over. This seems to have been due to the influence of Edmund Gross, who was a doctor who had helped establish the Lafayette Escadrille, as well as the American Hospital of Paris and the American Ambulance Field Service. Gross apparently didn't want a Black man in the Lafayette Escadrille, and he seems to have pulled strings to try to keep Bullard out of the service. Some of the accounts of all this describe The evidence of all of this is circumstantial, but there sure is a lot of it. There are a lot of times where Bullard was kept from doing something and uh, Dr. Gross seems to have been involved. Finally, Bullard was ordered to report for further combat flight training on August 5th of 1917. Ultimately, Bullard was assigned to Escadrille's SPA-93, flying his first mission in September of 1917. 
and he had a monkey named Jimmy with him, which he had brought back from Paris. It is not clear exactly how he got Jimmy, but Bullard called him his co-pilot and hid him in his flight jacket on missions. The fuselage of his plane was also decorated with a heart pierced with a dagger and the words, Tu le sang qui coule est rouge, or All blood that flows is red. In a lot of ways, Bullard's day-to-day life as a pilot was better than it had been in the infantry. Just the basic living essentials were safer and cleaner and more predictable. He had regular meals and snacks and a clean place to sleep, and he wasn't in the trenches anymore. But at the same time, being a combat pilot was really dangerous. More than 200 Americans flew for France during the war, both in the Escadrille and in other units, and 68 of them were killed. Since they usually flew in these single-seat biplanes, the men who were killed usually died alone. This was just a different kind of grief and trauma than what Bullard had been experiencing in the infantry, where the vast scale of death could become so overwhelming that it was almost numbing. So it was like both of them were really traumatic. In some ways, being a pilot felt more acute, if that makes sense. It does. Bullard flew about 20 missions during his time as a pilot, as part of Escadrille SPA-93 and later Escadrille SPA-85. He reported that he had shot down two German planes during that time. Those were not confirmed, though, which wouldn't have been unusual if the planes crashed behind German lines and nobody else was around to see it. Bullard also crashed at one point after his plane was hit from the ground. He hid from German troops until the French came to retrieve the plane. His time as a pilot did not last for very long, though. The United States became involved in World War I in April of 1917, and once American troops actually started arriving in Europe months later, the American pilots in the Lafayette Escadrille were transferred into the American military. But not Bullard. There is some conflicting information around this. Bullard blamed Dr. Edmund Gross, who definitely did write a letter laying out some flatly false reasons to keep Bullard out of the American military. Gross said that Bullard had been imprisoned for 10 days, which he had not, after an altercation with an officer. That altercation did happen in response to that officer's racism. Other French officers who had witnessed this had sided with Bullard, who was reprimanded, but definitely not jailed. Yeah, this officer was in command of some of the troops that had been recruited from France's colonial territories. So those would have been people of color, and apparently the officer was saying really disparaging things, and Eugene Jock Bullard was not having it, and other officers backed him up as being in the right Gross also said that Bullard had been imprisoned for a further 20 days for wearing a forager that was only allowed to be worn by members of the Foreign Legion, which Gross implied Bullard was not one of. Bullard had been wearing this forager because he earned it as a member of the French Foreign Legion, which Gross had either overlooked in his record or just lied about in this letter. There was no 20-day jail term involved with all of this because Bullard had not been doing anything wrong. He was wearing a decoration he had earned. (laughs) Gross wrote back to Captain W.W. Hoffman of the American Expeditionary Force that Bullard was being transferred back to the French infantry for all these reasons. It's also noted that all the other pilots being transferred into the American military were officers, and Bullard wasn't. And one source on Bullard claims that his physical exam didn't disqualify him from service, but did note that both his feet and his tonsils were too large, and his name was last on the list of pilots whose physicals were acceptable. However, even without any of that, it is extremely unlikely that the U.S. military would have accepted Bullard as a pilot. The U.S. military was racially segregated, and most Black men served in labor battalions. The ones who served in combat roles were in the 92nd and 93rd Combat Divisions, most famously in the 369th Infantry, better known as the Harlem Hellfighters. We have an episode on the Harlem Hellfighters that we ran as a Saturday Classic in June of 2020. The American military just would not have viewed a Black pilot as an option. 
Gross had not wanted Bullard to fly for the Lafayette Escadrille in the first place and had subjected him to a lot of petty slights, including paying him late and never giving him an honorary scroll that the French Ministry of War had presented to all the other pilots. So at this point, Gross seems to have taken the opportunity to end his service as a pilot entirely. In January of 1918, Bullard was transferred back to the 170th Infantry. Around this same time, there was a brief mention of him in the NAACP's publication, The Crisis, mentioning that he had joined the French Foreign Legion, been wounded at Verdun, earned the Croix de Guerre, and enlisted in the Aviation Corps after leaving the hospital following his injury. This did not have the most recent news involving him. Presumably, the person who wrote this did not know that information yet. But this seems to be the only mention of Eugene Bullard in American media from during the war. Although Bullard had been able to fly a plane, his earlier leg wound still affected his mobility enough that he couldn't just move back into his previous role as a machine gunner. So he spent the rest of World War I in a service battalion. After the war, his service was seen as particularly heroic since he was one of the Americans who served in France long before the U.S. entered the war and had been wounded more than once in the process. Because he had been wounded in service to France, Bullard was also eligible for French citizenship and later identified himself as a French citizen. After the war was over, Bullard went back to Paris. He doesn't seem to have had his monkey Jimmy with him anymore, According to some accounts, Jimmy died during the 1918 flu pandemic. We'll talk more about Bullard's life in Paris in our next episode. Will we talk about listener mail in the meantime? We will. Uh, This listener mail is from Heather, and Heather wrote, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I hope this email finds you well. I started listening to your podcast after the start of the pandemic, and I have to say it has been essential to my daily walking routine and general intellectual enrichment. Today, on my daily walk with our dog, Zorro, I listened to the episode on Thomas Midgley Jr. and his deadly inventions. In the last part on the history of Freon, you ended it by mentioning that the world's response to the science showing Freon's negative impact on the ozone layer demonstrated what was possible when a substitute is available. What is interesting is that what eventually replaced Freon and other CFCs used as refrigerants hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, are now considered among the culprits of global warming and climate change, being accountable for about 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Recent years have seen the global community rally around initiatives to phase out HFCs in a movement reminiscent of the global phase-out of Freon and CFCs. And the UN, EU, and many nations are legislating to reduce their usage. In the U.S., the bipartisan followed by two exclamation points in parentheses. 2020 American Innovation and Manufacturing, or AIM Act, mandates the eventual phase-out of listed high global warming potential, or GWP, HFCs. The irony in all of this is that the substitutes available and being promoted, ammonia, propane, and carbon dioxide, are the very chemicals that were considered too toxic or flammable to continue to use in refrigeration back in the first part of the 20th century and made Freon a viable alternative back then. However, in the present day, these chemicals can be used as refrigerants much more safely due to the advanced engineering of refrigeration equipment that prevents fires and leaks in most cases. These natural refrigerants have zero or very low GWP. Anyway, thought you might enjoy this footnote. Uh, And then Heather also included pictures of a cat, Cthulhu, the great old one. She's not actually that old, but does sometimes embody her Lovecraftian namesake's (laughs) behaviors. Uh, Oh, and the dog is cute too. So we have a dog picture. This dog is super cute. Uh, I, I do not know if this is a girl dog or a boy dog, but... Uh, The dog is kind of rolling around with a mouth open, adorable posture. Um, And then also such a very cute cat, making very cute cat faces. Um, Looks like this kitty cat has a tipped ear in one picture, so I wonder what the kitty cat's background is. Uh, That's uh, a lot of um, ferals and strays have their ears tipped after being... Vaccinated. Spayed or neutered and vaccinated and uh, sometimes returned to their feral colonies. Yes, because they can test positive for things they have been vaccinated for. Yes, yes. Or you can have a cat 
like my now gone cat, Mr. Burns, who tears his own ear in a way that makes people think <laughs> that happened. But in fact, he just got a claw caught in it and pulled. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he was fine. Poor Mr. Burns. He was fine. So thank you for all these cat pictures and for this footnote. Another thing that we did not mention in the episode is that new ozone-depleting substances are being developed all the time and the progress toward the hole in the ozone layer and general ozone depletion repairing itself only continues to work if we continue to not use those substances once they're known to be ozone depleting. We did not specifically say that in the episode, so I wanted to take the opportunity to say it now. Thank you again, Heather, for this note and all of the adorable animal pictures. If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're all over social media at Miston History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. We are, I know it maybe seems like this has been the case forever, we're still between offices, so still not a great way to send us any physical items. Mm-mm. See what happens with that. Uh, you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you like to get podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.